Um, Linda and Eduardo Marban had been looking at cardiospheres. I probably said that wrong. But um, a woman out of California who was looking at some of the stem cell in her view research approached them and said, could you think about Duchenne? And they did, and she's here to talk about their breaking news. Thank you, Pat. Okay, uh, full disclosure, my PhD has never taught me how to really work these things, so let me see if I can make this work. There's a laser pointer in here, right? There we go, okay. Uh, Capricor is a publicly traded NASDAQ listed company under the symbol CAPR. My name is Linda Marban. I'm the CEO of Capricor. I'm presenting today because Dr. Craig McDonald, our national PI, is at home recovering from you know what. <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit about CAP1002. So CAP1002 is an allogeneic, that means it's an off the shelf cell therapy product. We make the cells from donated hearts. These are hearts, you might have heard this this morning, but I'll repeat it. Um, these are transplant qualified hearts, um, but can't be used for technical reasons. And to give you perspective, that happens about 40% of the time. So we don't ever expect there to be um, a demand exceeding supply type of issue. CAP-1002 has been in several hundred patients to date very safely. I'll go over the safety profile in the next few minutes. What I'd like to call your attention to on this slide is that these are not stem cells. So we started off our journey now a good 15 years ago thinking that they were stem cells. The academic pathway has taught us a lot about the cells along the way. They're not stem cells. What they do um, is they work by releasing exosomes, which are very tiny, um, molecules of communication between cells. And inside the exosomes are um, microRNAs, um, other types of proteins, and other ways of signaling muscles to repair themselves. And let me take you on now the clinical journey of Capricorn. So the good thing about CAP-1002, well, there's a lot of great things about CAP-1002, but one of the nice things for patients is that it's a very, very easy protocol to follow. So right now, our dosing paradigm is four times a year. Once a quarter, um, the Duchenne patient comes into the center. Um, he gets a very simple IV. Um, it's about a 45-minute infusion protocol, and we have um, a very simple oral premedication regimen that the patient takes the day before to prevent any type of an allergic reaction. Um, we've done hundreds of these now, including 94 infusions um, in the open-label extension data that I'm going to present to you today, all of which has been done thankfully, very safely. So let's talk about Capricor's patient population. We are right now targeting those patients that are primarily non-ambulant or at the verge of losing ambulation. And for this audience today, I don't really have to go through this very um, specific diagram of how the disease progresses because you know how this happens. You know that you ultimately notice that your children are losing function. Um, slowly through skeletal muscle decline, they become dependent upon a wheelchair for um, getting around. And then um, it's sort of after that loss of upper limb, getting ventilation, and what really ends up being of concern to most patients and families is the cardiomyopathy associated with Duchenne, which is another uh, paradigm upon which we have uh, very positive clinical data. We're really lucky that we entered into this space, and we're really delighted to be able to provide an opportunity um, for the um, sustainment of upper limb function, because as many of you know, for these boys and young men, this is the definition of independence. So because we were looking at um, patients that primarily were off their feet, we couldn't use um, an ambulation test of, of how they would function. So we had to um, do some nosing around. And now this takes us back a few years to our first clinical trial called Hope Duchenne. Uh, we found a measure called the performance of the upper limb. Most of you are probably familiar with it now. It was pretty new when we started working at it. It's a 21 item scale that was developed by physicians, patients, um, and physical therapists that are analogous to activities of daily living. So for instance, lifting light and heavy cans might be able to drink a soda or some other type of beverage, comb your hair, hand to mouth function, all of these activities which correlate with maintaining independence. So we have adopted the performance of the upper limb as our main measure of efficacy so that we can determine how CAP-1002 is working in boys and young men with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. 
Okay, don't get scared, I'll take you through this slide. It's not as complicated as it looks. So we've been doing this clinical trial work uh, for quite a while now, um, and shown in this uh, figure here is sort of the paradigm of treatment. I'm gonna walk you through this, and I'm gonna walk you through it again, because it'll help you understand the data, because I'm framing out where I'm taking you. So the first study that I'm gonna be re referencing back to today is HOPE2. HOPE2 was a 20-patient, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial where we used the exact infusion regimen that I just spoke about, um, and we were able to identify statistically significant improvements in the performance of the upper limb in our patient population, as well as improvements in ejection fraction and other measures of cardiac function. Now, at the end of HOPE2, and by the way, this data has been published in The Lancet, and so um, that's available on our website. I can provide you with a hard copy, or it's easy to download online if you're interested in all of the details of that trial. What we realized when we got to the end of HOPE2 is that uh, there was a tremendous uh, energy uh, to continue on for those patients that were in the trial. Now, I will tell you that to this day, um, as far as I know, the patients in our trial are not unblinded as to which group they were originally in, um, because what we decided to do is make CAP-1002 available to anybody that had been um, in HOPE2 in an open-label extension study. And that paradigm is shown here in yellow or gold. Now, because it takes a very long time with regulations and IRBs and all the stuff that you guys know um, well, well aware of, it took about a year to get the open label extension going. So the average time off of CAP-1002 of all the patients was about a year. And you'll see the difference between the placebo patients and the treated patients in the next slide. Now, um, because of the data that you're about to see, but also because um, we believe that it is ethically um, our responsibility, we're continuing this trial or this uh, access to CAP-1002 to the patients for out to 24 months, look for that data. Um, we'll be presenting it uh, fairly soon, and then out to 36 months as well. So we have a commitment to our patients uh, to keep them um, on treatment as long as, as possible. Now, again, I, I'm going to sort of highlight this for you because it's going to be important as I go through a pretty complicated uh, data paradigm. So I just want to refresh you with the idea that we did hope to one year. Um, you're going to see that data. Those patients were um, randomized and double-blind, placebo-controlled. Then we have this, what we call the gap phase, that time off of treatment, approximately one year, 392 days. And then the open-label extension, and you're going to be seeing the one-year data today. Um, our patients were um, made, it was made available to all of the people that were in HOPE2. Um, they had uh, 13 of them that originally signed up, 12 continued, one withdrew consent. They were 13 years of old. All by now are non-ambulant, and everybody in our trials are required to be on stable regimens of steroids so that we can um, provide uh, the best care that's available to them. Okay, what happened to our placebo patients? This is the first data slide that I'm going to take you through, um, and I like to call this my hockey stick. Um, so what you're looking at up here is, in the dark red line, are the placebo patients that were in HOPE2. And we know that they had um, a decline in the performance of the upper limb scores um, up to about four points, which is pretty close to what's been reported in natural history. Then look at this gap phase. They're in the gap phase. They are on a steady decline. So basically, basically from when they come in at the beginning of the trial all the way to the end of the gap phase, they are on a steady decline in their performance of their upper limb scores. And then they start the open label extension study. And look what happens. Their disease path completely um, flattens out. They end up having um, a saving a function of about 70%. So you'll see that uh, in the next few slides. So this is um, sort of the foundation of, of the preservation of function. They've lost those pull points. They're never getting them back. Um, but we are now able to slow the progression of the disease pretty much to a crawl. OK, so what happened to our CAP-1002 patients? Let me walk you through that. So in blue here, again, and this is the published data in the Lancet paper, in blue are the CAP-1002 treated patients. And then they go into the gap phase, and look, they're on a steady decline too. And then they go into the open label extension, and the progression of the disease really goes uh, quite into slow motion. But what is the most important takeaway from this slide? The most important takeaway from this slide is that what you're seeing is potential disease modifying behavior. So it's not just symptomatic modification of the disease. What you're actually seeing, it's not like a headache where you take to Motrin and then four hours later the, the headache comes back. What you're seeing is that even though 
these patients or, or um, subjects in our trial are declining during the gap phase. They're not declining like their placebo, um, you know, co-trial participants have declined. And yet they're able to then immediately go into recovery mode, so to speak, uh, once they go on CAP-1002. So this is really exciting data. Um, it's not only exciting um, from the perspective of you know, the, the patients, it's exciting because it gives us the opportunity to say that staying on CAP-1002 for a long time should really slow the progression of your disease and therefore um, is something that we are very committed to, to continue this path forward. And then finally, and I know this is my most complicated graphic and, and full disclosure, I'm a PhD scientist, so kind of geeky uh, data gets to me, and I love this one uh, because this shows very clearly something that I think um, I want to, uh, share with you. So look at the slopes of these lines. These are the placebo-treated patients in red um, during the HOPE-2 phase. These are the CAP-1002 treated patients in blue during the HOPE phase. Now they come off of, of um, the CAP-1002 or placebo and they go into their sort of long gap phase. Look at the slope of this line. They're literally identical whether you're in the placebo group or in the gap phase. That means you're really seeing um, a, the natural history, the, the rapid decline of the, of the disease. What you're seeing in the, in the HOPE-2 or the CAP-1002 treated patients is that they're also essentially on that same slope. They just start at a higher point and get to finish off at a higher point before they come back into um, the open label extension, but I think it's pretty clear that if we kept them off long term, they'd continue and ultimately catch up with their uh, co-trial participants in the, in the placebo group. Now, let's look at this open label extension data. Compare it to, here's the CAP-1002 treated patients, look at the slope of that line, and then look at the slope of the CAP-1002 treated participants. This is the merged um, data of the placebo patients and the CAP-1002 treated patients because by now they've all been off therapy for a year when they come into the open label extension study. So now we treat them sort of all as, as the same cohort of patients. And now look at this slope of this line. It's literally the same as the attenuation of decline is, is uh, really evident now um, in those that are back on CAP-1002. So again, this is further evidence of the potential disease-modifying opportunity for CAP-1002 in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And of course, the statistics bear out uh, what the data and the pictures tell us, which is that it's very statistically significant. What you're looking at here is the open label extension group, that's this group, versus the placebo group from HOPE-2, and that's a p-value of 0.01, which says that um, you have a very small chance that this data is due to chance. And then if you look at the open label extension group versus the placebo group in the gap phase, um, you're seeing even more um, of a statistical significance, again, saying there is a very, very, very minute chance that what you're seeing is due to chance. So I think we can sort of walk out of here today and say the CAP-1002 is attenuating the progression of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So what does this translate into in terms of long-term opportunity for uh, boys and young men with Duchenne muscular dystrophy? If you actually look at this graphic, and our, our stats team uh, prepared this for us, um, and I'm very grateful to them because it gave me sort of the visual that not only were we slowing the disease by 70%, but what does that mean? That means that for every year of progression of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, you're actually saving eight months of function. Right? So if you think about, do the simple math, take eight months of function in one year, multiply that out by three years. So if the patients that had come into um, to, uh, HOPE-2 several years ago now had stayed on CAP-1002 for all three years, they might have preserved nine points of pull function. Now, this is hypothetical, right? We don't have that data to support it, but this is sort of where we think long-term therapy would take us, and this would delay the disease then by 10 pull points, which is actually hand-to-mouth function, is actually the ability to uh, take a drink of water, push an elevator button, um, and a variety of, of other tasks, including my favorite from past, which is the ability to hug a family member. So uh, we are you know, taken um, very seriously, this data. This is a very unique uh, trial situation because we have patients basically serving as their own controls. These are boys and young men that you know, were in a placebo group. They were declining, and we've attenuated the rate of decline now by two-thirds or, or more than two-thirds at 70%. So. Um, I just want to leave you today sort of with the idea that CAP-1002 has uh, 
you know, potential for disease modifying benefit. That means changing the progression of the disease. Um, the patients that are on AP1002 experience a slower prog progression of their disease. We got to get people on CAP1002, right? Because as you saw in the GAF phase, once those pull points, once muscle is lost, there is no getting it back. So we can attenuate the progression, but once it's gone, it's gone. We have a very uh, strong safety profile, um, looking you know, to, to continue that, and uh, very simple oral premedication regimen, as I mentioned. And those of you that were lucky enough to hear my colleague this morning, uh, Dr. Dan Paulson, talk about HOPE3. It's our pivotal trial. It's open for enrollment at uh, sites around the United States, and uh, you know, we're, we're looking to enroll that rapidly so that we can get this uh, therapeutic out on the market and available to all the potential boys and young men with Duchenne who deserve the chance of the best life possible. And then finally, um, we're positioning CAP-1002 as what I would call backbone therapy. Um, we can use it with Javinostat. Um, we can use it with um, anything else that gets approved out there, uh, gene therapy, um, exon skipping. You know, uh, one of my um, mentors in the space, Dr. Lee Sweeney, uh, said to me a few years ago, as we get, um, you know, gene therapy might get legs, and then boys and young men are going to be staying on their feet longer, more active longer. They're going to need other therapeutics to help support uh, the maintenance of the muscle to reduce inflammation, reduce fibrosis, the mechanism of action of CAP-1002. And we haven't talked today about cardiac disease. We didn't measure that in the open label extension, um, at least to this point. Um, but let's remember that one of the major mechanisms of action of CAP-1002 is the improvement in cardiac function. We had 107% um, improvement in cardiac function in HOPE-2, and that's in our Lancet paper. So we think this is going to be a therapy that is going to be able to be used um, in conjunction with um, anything else that comes along uh, that helps to improve the course of Duchenne. All right, I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to all of you. I want to say thank you to Parent Project. I have to tell you, and I know um, she gets embarrassed, but Pat is my um, personal hero. Um, you know, whenever I'm having a bad day and I feel like I can't do something, this is true, Pat, I think Pat did this. Look at what she built. Um, and she did it on the, on the backbone of, of tragedy. So thank you, Pat. Thank you, Parent Project. Thank you, Coalition Duchenne, where the idea for us came from. All the people that are investigators, um, all of the advocacy groups that we've had the pleasure of working with, and finally, um, my own team who's, who's back here supporting it. So thank you, and I hope you have a great rest of your conference. <laughs>